All right, everyone, welcome to the Black Achievement Fund's Missing Pages of World History Lecture Series in honor of Dr. John Henry Clark. Today, we are going to be discussing something that is, all of us feel, all of us are part of some religion for the most part. And we're gonna be talking about the origins of spirituality in the world. Remember, this is the missing pages of world history, not just African history. African history is world history. African people pioneered virtually every field of knowledge conceivable. When you do a Wiki Wikipedia search, or if you go to Google and you say, what are the oldest religions? Nine times out of 10, you're gonna get Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity. Where's my do that? Oh, yeah. can you mute people? Thank you. All right, as I was saying, if you do a Google search right now, and you put in what are the oldest religions? You're gonna get Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. There's not gonna be any mention of anything coming out of Africa. No mention of any African religion. This is a part of the propaganda of history. We've been talking about this since the beginning of this lecture series, and this lecture series is predicated upon the fact that African history has been hidden and written out of world history for obvious reasons. You can't claim supremacy. You can't claim that African people were in a state of barbarism when Europeans encountered them and that they had, had contributed nothing to world history. If you show or illuminate African history from the inception of human beings in Africa and follow it chronologically, we don't do that. In American public schools, history begins with Mesopotamia, well, civilization begins with Mesopotamia. There's cursory information about ancient Egypt, nothing about ancient Egypt being African. There's no mention of African spirituality being the foundation of all other religions. So this is what we're gonna be delving in today. Hinduism was started around 3000 years ago. The 42 laws of Mayat, you're talking 6,000 years ago, double the time. When you start researching African religions, nothing about the 42 laws are gonna come up. Nothing about Osiris, Isis, Horus, nothing about any of the comedic gods and goddesses, absolutely nothing. It's not even considered a religion. Instead, if you go to Wikipedia, and you put in the 42 laws of my art, book of the dead, anything like that. They refer to this as funerary texts, pyramid texts, coffin texts. But it is demoted from the level of spirituality or religion. Spirituality and religion arguably is the cornerstone of one's existence. It epitomizes what a person thinks is gonna happen when they die. It provides value systems for a person to live by while they're on earth in order to be rewarded in an afterlife. Where did this whole concept of an afterlife come from? And when you start talking about that, and talking about the dates, I'm gonna to go to our timeline for a minute. Here. 
Here you have the 42 laws of Mayotte on the timeline. Here you have Judaism, which is the oldest of the Abrahamic religions. Here you have Christianity. Here you have Islam. Now let's go all the way back. Here you are with the 42 laws of Mayat. Here you are with the religious system that is in place and has filtered through the entire society. The reason why it is called the Book of the Dead by Europeans is because when they went scavenging through ancient Kemet and opening all of the sacred tombs of these individuals, what they found were copies of the ancient Kemetic religious concepts and papyri. You had the 42 laws of Mayat there. You had what is considered spells to help one cross over into the afterlife. But in order for every human being to be born again in eternal life, he or she had to follow the laws of Mayat. All right. Now, what's so striking about this? Because it goes over a lot of people's heads often. What is so striking about the spirituality that was developed in ancient Kemet. Here you see Isis worshiping the god Mayat, goddess Mayat. Here you see a depiction of Anubis during the time of death. Here you see the weighing of the soul, which we're gonna talk about at the time of death. So again, this whole concept of life after death, the concept that Christianity, Christians believe in, Jews believe in, Muslims believe in, the origins of this concept is ancient Kemet literally thousands of years before the emergence of these other religions. Those that founded the religions that preceded this all came into Africa. All were aware of the spirituality and the religion that was developed and being practiced in ancient Kemet. Why? Because it was everywhere. The entire civilization was based in a spiritual framework. But what's most important is that this was led by a woman. Mayat is the ancient comedic Egyptian concept of truth, balance, order, law, morality, and justice. Maya is represented as a goddess with wings. She is a symbol of the moral and carnal laws of ancient Kemet and one of the most important of all the gods. She put order to the universe at the time of creation and is responsible for regulating the stars, seasons, and the actions of both mortals and deities. Through the 42 laws of Maya, she provides the moral and ethical guidelines in which all Egyptian citizens were to follow in order to achieve rebirth in the afterlife. Aside from her role in creation, Mayat played a critical role in the weighing of the soul that took place in the Duat or the underworld. In order to achieve reincarnation, one soul had to be quote, as light as a feather after reciting the 42 laws of Mayat before Osiris. Although the first mention of Mayat is found in the pyramid of Eunice of the fifth dynasty circa 2450 BC, we know that the laws of Mayat were formulated well before the establishment of ancient Egypt. Pharaohs were often depicted with adornments representing Mayat, illustrating their pharaonic responsibility and commitment to upholding her principles. The entire spiritual foundation of ancient Kemet was based on the principles set forth by a woman. 
In ancient Egypt, women were given independence from men, were allowed to own property, and in few cases, they rose to the level of Pharaoh. In ancient Africa, women were valued more and given more rights than any other culture in antiquity. Women were seen as a counterpart to man, not his inferior. For every Egyptian god, there was a corresponding god, goddess. And this was a part of balance. Everything was about creating a balance. I'm gonna read the 42 laws of Mayat or the negative confessions of Mayat because I want you guys to feel the weight of these 42 laws. Every day, everyone from Kemet had to recite not 10 commandments, not 10, 42 laws. I'm gonna read them. I have not committed sin. I have not committed robbery with violence. I have not stolen. I have not slain men or women. I have not stolen food. I have not swindled offerings. I have not stolen from God goddess. I have not told lies. I have not carried away food. I have not cursed. I have not closed my ears to truth. I have not committed adultery. I have not made anyone cry. I have not felt sorrow without reason. I have not assaulted anyone. I am not deceitful. I have not stolen anyone's land. I have not been an eavesdropper. I have not falsely accused anyone. I have not been angry without reason. I have not seduced anyone's wife. I have not polluted myself. I have not terrorized anyone. I have not disobeyed the law. I have not been exclusively angry. I have not cursed God goddess. I have not behaved with violence. I have not caused disruption of peace. I have not acted hastily or without thought. I have not overstepped my boundaries of concern. I have not exaggerated my words when speaking. I have not worked evil. I have not used evil thoughts, words, or deeds. I have not polluted the water. I have not spoken angrily or arrogantly. I have not cursed anyone in thought, word, or deeds. I have not placed myself on a pedestal. I have not stolen what belongs to God, goddess. I have not stolen from or disrespected the deceased. I have not taken food from a child. I have not acted with insolence. I have not destroyed property belonging to God, goddess. Saying that every day and fervently believing that if I don't live up to these 42 laws, I will not be able to be reborn. Now understanding comedic civilization, they believed in this so much that they actually buried, created tombs and buried furniture, food, precious jewelry, everything that they were gonna need once they were reborn in a literal sense. They literally thought they was gonna take everything with them and be reborn with them again. This is the foundation of formalized spirituality, religion in the world. This is not African history. This is world history. Here you have African people thousands of years before the invent of any other religion developing the highest civilization ever known to man and this civilization being solely standing on the foundation of religious principles. Can you name any other major empire that was founded on spirituality? This spirituality was not dictated to the people of Kemet by an elite class of people, by a warrior, by a pharaoh. These concepts were things that were discussed and the concepts evolved based on their understanding of nature, of balance. It was not created to exploit. It was created to regulate the actions of man within this civilization so that we all can reach our highest self. 
and be reborn again. So when I talk about African history or when we talk about these fascinating aspects of African history, others like to claim that we're romanticizing. We're romanticizing black people. This is why having this history is so important. We don't have to romanticize anything. It's written, it's everywhere. It's just that we don't have access to it because it is too empowering. Let's look at this idea This is Isis suckling, a whore is suckling Isis. This 4,000 BC, and this is the Christian version. Isis is a black woman, a goddess with wings. What is an angel? A white woman with what? With wings. You had the Holy Trinity in ancient Kemet. Isis, Osiris, and Horus. You have a Holy Trinity in Christianity. You have the 42 laws of Mayat. Then you have the 10 commandments. And I'm talking about literally Thousands of years later, there is no historian on the planet that will refute when the 42 laws of Mayat were first discovered, the oldest documents. No one will refute that. So if this is the case, how do we study world history and not know the foundation of where all spirituality come from, the whole concept of a God. But once again, if you go on your own and start researching this spirituality, you're not gonna find anything black. You're not gonna find anything African. Black and African is never associated with the ancient Egyptians. There were an incredible number of gods and goddesses in ancient Egypt, one for almost every situation and place. Many of the gods began as local deities and were later organized and merged with others to form either a triad or an ennead. There were several schools of theological thought in Egypt and each proclaimed its superiority over the others. A ruling dynasty would often promote their chief local god to the chief national god. For example, a moon associated with Thebes did not become a major deity until the shift of power to Thebes in the Middle Kingdom. Many of ancient Egypt's gods and goddesses share characteristics and epithets at different times in history. For example, Shekmet, the lion goddess of Memphis, Mut and Tefnut and Hathor are all given the title, the Eye of Ra, and given the task of protecting the sun god. There is often confusion about the different gods known as Horus. For example, Horus the Elder was often thought to be the consort of Hathor, while Horus the Younger was the son of Isis and Osiris. This is unsurprising given that the Egyptian civilization survived for over 3,000 years and the religious system was constantly evolving. In pre dynastic times, religion was largely animistic. They considered certain animals, plants, and geographic features to be the homes of spirits. Many ancient Egyptian gods are represented by totemic animals based on the ancient understanding of the role or characteristic of the animal. For example, Anubis, the jackal, was associated with the dead and funeral arrangements because jackals were often seen on the edge of the desert where the Egyptians were buried. It was considered that the jackals guarded the souls of the deceased. As the Egyptians were dependent on the flooding of the life-giving now, it is hardly surprising that water deities such as Happy and Anket and agriculture deities such as Osiris would be popular. As their civilization developed, the gods of ancient Egypt took more human form and multiplied in number. Cosmological deities such as the sun and moon 
and gods of warfare and hunting soon followed. Even during the Atenis heresy of the Armana period, when Akhenaten rejected the old gods in favor of the Atendis, Egypt was not fully monotheistic. Akhenaten himself claimed he would maintain the cult of the Apis bull and representations of Bes, the god of childbirth, were found in his capital city. Furthermore, he and his queen Nefertiti were often likened to Shu and Tefnu. However, it is clear that monotheistic Christianity adopted, modified, and simplified many of the symbols and myths of the ancient polytheistic religions, in particular that of the ancient Egyptians. Even here, all of the images, this is from the Ptolemaic period when the Greeks conquered ancient uh, Kemet. When European scholars present anything from ancient Kemet, it is often images when the Greeks and the Romans had taken over. By the time the Greeks had taken over ancient Kemet in 332 BC, ancient Kemet had been over for 500 years. The last remaining African dynasty was the 25th dynasty and they fell in 664 BC. Why is this so important? Religion is paramount to how a people regulate their behavior. Religion gives people a sense of culture, a sense of identity, a sense of shared purpose. When you strip someone of their religion, you're stripping someone of their identity, of their world view. Imagine if someone came right now and tried to strip you of whatever you believed in religiously. How would you feel? How devastating would that be to you right now? If someone came and forcefully said, you can't be a Christian no more, Christianity is barbaric. It's backwards, it's based on myth. It's not based on anything factual and forced you to take up their religion right now. Let's not talk about slavery. Let's talk about if somebody did that to you right now. Once you take on someone else's religion, you begin to take on someone else's worldview. When African religion, when African spirituality was written out of history, African people, because we're spiritual people, as you've seen, we started spirituality. There had to be some way to fill the void. So if you know nothing else about your old religion anymore, but yet here's this one religion that exists that you are allowed to participate in, you're gonna participate in it. You're a spiritual person. Over time, African people and African Americans, most of us have no idea that spirituality was created in Africa, that the concepts of Christianity, of Judaism, of Islam are all rooted in African spirituality. When you delve into the foundations of African spirituality, you see that African people were so spiritual. They worship everything. They worship the water for being life-giving. They had reverence for animals for their wisdom and being able to utilize their wisdom. So when you begin to study ain't the uh, evolution of spirituality in Africa, when you start to read the creation stories and things like that, all of these things are in line 
with what people saw happening on earth. Their spirituality was centered on earth, but they understood that the things that were happening were so powerful that there had to be some greater source, some greater power governing all of this. They knew that the moon regulated the waters. Animal activity. They watch this, they're studying this. They're depending on astrological knowledge to be able to domesticate fruits and vegetables. You have to be able to pinpoint when the Nile is gonna flood. So you have these individuals looking up in the stars and recording that every day. The world's oldest uh, soul observatory is in Africa. But yet, everyone's religion is based off of African religion, African spirituality, and absolutely no credit is given to the people who created the blueprint. Right now, you can go to Google, search, whatever, put in old religions, the world's oldest religion, Africa ain't gonna come up. But then if you put in the 42 laws of Maya, you begin to see, oh, well, this is way older than Hinduism, so why isn't this considered a religion? Anything that Africans have done that has been great has been completely wiped out of world history. They call what Africans created animism. It's not spirituality, it's not religion. They try to say the African people are all polytheistic and they degraded polytheism. You're not civilized if you believe in more than one God. Even though the people of ancient Kemet, they didn't believe in multiple gods in the way that is being presented. They believe that an overarching God manifested itself through all of these different areas of the world, through nature, through animals. And they gave honor to that. The civilization of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, lasted for over 3,000 years. I can't think of any other civilization that's close to that. How can ancient Kemet, the most brilliant civilization ever known to man, the longest continuous civilization in, on record, and you don't know nothing about it, is not studied in, in world history. Every element of knowledge was developed in Africa. Human beings were in Africa and Africa alone for 70,000 years approximately before they left. Here we operate in 6,000 years of written history. What do you think people did in 70,000 years? 70,000 years. How much knowledge do you think came out of 70,000 years of observation on earth? And all of this history is conveniently erased. If more black people knew about the foundation of religion and that the foundation of all world religions that exist right now, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, are all based in comedic spiritual principles. How many would be studying something else? You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. How is it that in 2021, 
Black people, we are hyper aware of the fact that Black people are not represented in curricula in any meaningful way in public school systems. However, there is no discernible fight to include any of this. This lecture series is not just about providing you with knowledge. What do you do with it? How do you make knowledge work for you? How does knowledge make you powerful? Knowing who you are, knowing that the history of your people was based on spirituality, that your civilizations were started on just foundations of righteousness. Compare the formation of ancient Egypt to the formation of other empires. How did other empires get established that you know about, that you've read about? African history is not romanticized history. When we say that, when you hear that black men treat black women worse than any men treat their women in any other culture. When I hear that and hear a black person be like, oh, black woman, oh, I'm just like, what have you studied? Because I can show you right here that the oldest religion in the world, the oldest spirituality in the world was founded in Africa. And the 42 laws in which every black person, man, woman, child had to obey was set forth by a woman. How do other religions treat women? What is the highest rank of a woman in other religions? What is the highest rank of a woman in other societies? As you're gonna learn in ancient Kemet, women were king. Women were able to be king. And not no ceremonial king, ruler. And not just ruler of any civilization. Ruler of the most advanced civilization ever known to man, women. The entire code of ethics based on laws created by women. Every God has a corresponding goddess demonstrating balance. So when you don't know African history, you are susceptible to propaganda. When you study the other religions, I want you to contrast it to what I'm teaching you here. And everything that I'm showing you here, it, you can go research it. This isn't just coming from black people. This is accepted, established knowledge. It's just hidden because it's ours. In Egypt right now, they can't teach this. If this was taught right now in schools, if the history that I'm teaching you was taught in sequence, as I'm teaching it to you right now, what would that be saying about other people, other religions, all of this? What would it say? It would say that you all are frauds. These are facts. We have allowed conquerors, our conquerors, to steal our knowledge 
and use it against us. Steal it, destroy it, tell us we never invented nothing, present something modified, this is what you need to learn, and know we're going to fall for it because we've already seen it in another lifetime. You've seen something similar to it. Part of dismantling African culture was dismantling African claim to being the originators of religion. If you had to admit to the world that African people, that black African people, because ain't no light-skinned Africans nowhere during this time. You had people on the north coast of Africa in uh, what is uh, what was Carthage and other places uh, in North Africa, what is Libya. And these were people that were originally from Phoenicia. And this was the first influx of a, a, a whiter skinned people into Africa on a permanent basis. And this is where you begin to get the variation within the new kingdom and things like that. You will see them incorporated into um, the royal family as servants and caretakers. If you teach history from the origins of humanity in Africa 200,000 years ago, what you're going to show is that every element of world knowledge came from black people in Africa and then other people ran with it. How can you develop the type of technology and the things that were developed in ancient Kemet in frozen ground and sand to work with sand to work with? In order to reach the level of civilization that ancient Kemet reached, you have to be able to feed everyone on without that being any issue for people to be able to have the luxury to be a jewelry maker, the luxury to be an artist, the luxury to be a musician. Human civilization developed outright in Africa and was transported from Africa to the rest of the world. By the time human beings left Africa, the human being had over 70,000 years of knowledge that it had developed. However, think about this, when they left, Half of their knowledge is obsolete now. You're in a whole different environment. Rules don't apply here that apply to where you're from. Nature isn't as forgiving here as it is where you're from. So a harsh new reality occurs. Within this reality, it's much difficult to develop spirituality, to develop reverence for animals. You don't see no animals. If you saw them, you would be trying to eat them. Different worldviews emerge. It is important for you as an African person, and I say African because if you call yourself an African-American, you're saying you're African before you're American, and that is the true sequence of events. The foundation of world history is in Africa. African people are the oldest people on the planet. African culture is the oldest culture on the planet. And it must follow that African civilization was the first. It would be absurd to think that civilization, human beings, originate in Africa two, over 200,000 years ago, don't leave until 130,000 uh, uh, years ago. And that nothing happened 
no civilization, none of this knowledge were gathered until they left Africa? How absurd is that? You mean to tell me people that are struggling to eat, people that are struggling to survive are creating uh, spirituality? What are they happy about? People, we have been duped. We have been duped out of knowledge of who we are historically, knowledge of our religious beliefs. And we've been given other people's history as fact. It really saddens me as an African person when I tried to talk to black people, contemporary black people about African religion, African spirituality. And it's one of the most difficult conversations that you can have with a black person because it's like a war in the inside. You may have been a Christian for a long time. You may have been a, a Muslim for a long time. You, whatever, whatever it is that you practice. And because in order to be a good Christian, a good Muslim, you have to have complete faith and submission. Had you known about the foundation of religion, being from Africa, had you been given an African spiritual cosmology that I'm showing you now, wouldn't you have at least But if you don't know it at all, if it's not shown, if you don't have access to it, how you even, you don't know to even go to it. I just showed you, you go Google the world's oldest religion, ain't nothing from Africa gonna even show up. And here are all the concepts right there, life and death, the concept of a God and a goddess. So here's the irony. You can go on Google and you can say, where were the oldest gods from? And then they'll have to tell you, Egypt, ancient Egypt. But if the oldest gods from ancient Egypt, how can the oldest religion be Hindu? When you study world history from the origins of humanity in Africa over 200,000 years ago, and you go in linear fashion like this, you will be completely demystified of white supremacy. You would laugh at yourself for ever, belie for ever believing that white people were superior to African people in anything. And I'm not making this an argument saying that African people are superior to anyone either. But what I am saying is that African people were the progenitors of all facets of knowledge that created what we come to know as civilization. And this is not romanticizing anything. These are all facts. What I do know as a fact and what you're seeing right here is that the formation of spirituality happened in Africa, but yet Africa is given no credit for it whatsoever. The Jews won't tell you that the 10 commandments or a version of the 42 laws of my eye. They damn near is a, a virtual copy. But they was like, look, we ain't got time for do 42. That's a lot. Let's just do 10. That'll work. When we're talking about world history, when we're talking about African history, this is a battle against racism, white supremacy and all of that, because the foundations of racism and white supremacy are based on the falsification of African and world history. 
The foundations of racism and white supremacy are based on the propaganda that African people had contributed nothing to world history ever. And that they were in a state of darkness until the Europeans brought the light in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. And that because white people are the most superior people on earth, they should rule everybody on earth. This is absurd. Europeans are the youngest members of the family tree, of the human family tree. How do they get to be superior? Where? When the rest of the world have thousands of years of accumulated knowledge. We live in a system where might makes right. Because I can build the best guns, that don't make me the smartest at all. And watching our society, I witness it all the time. We're doing ourselves a disservice by not having our priorities as a race in order in terms of what's necessary to overcome all of the racism, self-hatred. It's staring us right in the face. It's through education. How does the white person come to feel that he or she is so much greater than everybody else? Education. They're being taught to believe that. And it ain't even true. There is a, um, a woman, I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with her. Um, what is her name? The, psych, uh, the psychiatrist, who um, white woman, who did the brown eye, uh, Jane Elliott, brown eye, blue eye um, test. Uh, and this was a test, I believe, in the 70s or, or late 60s, in which she took a class of third or fifth graders or something like that. And she essentially told them one set of group with blue eyes that people with, who had blue eyes were dumb and stupid. And that they had to wear this band on their head or what have you. And of course, and then she switched it and said, no, 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 I made a mistake. It's the kids with brown eyes. So the kids with brown eyes who were picking on the blue eyes because the blue eyes were called stupid and all of that, then they got a taste of the same thing. But what ended up happening was over the course of a week, the students who were deemed the inferior ones for that particular day performed worse throughout the day, performed worse on um, flashcards, and when she asked, she said, well, yesterday when you guys didn't have these things on, you, you did the flashcards in like, you know, 30 seconds. And now today it's like two minutes. What's going on? And the kids were like, because we got these collars on, we, it's, it's affecting us. The psychological effects of racism, the psychological effects of the type of curriculum that is in place in America, it is dangerous. It is the cause of identity crisis. It is the cause of black people literally becoming mentally insane. Our middle class has been able to embrace European curriculum in a way that has enabled them to gain material success. I gotta study white history. I gotta know white people in order for me to get a good job and live well in America. So they have literally given currency to white supremacy. Currency to white supremacy. You embrace white supremacy. You don't fight against the curriculum that 
is in place. You don't fight to end the mental colonization that is happening through this school system. As long as you turn a blind eye to it, we'll allow you to become an honorary European. We'll allow you to work at one of our prestigious companies, make $100,000 a year, buy a home that's bigger than the other black people so that you can, you know, and we've accepted this. And sometimes I don't know is it is truly because we don't know any better because we don't know this is exists or is it because we've lost the fight? We've lost the will to fight certain things. I'm not knocking anyone who studies any religion, especially if you had no idea that anything else existed that was yours, that your people created. But as a black person, I ask myself, to what extent are we as a, a, as a people obligated to educate ourselves and to fight for a well-balanced and just curriculum. During the first or second class of this lecture series, I showed all of this, these instances of just terrible racism in the public schools all across the country, all across the nation, everywhere. Not a Southern thing, everywhere. I only see white people fighting against it. I don't see no black people fighting against it. We're doing the opposite. Here I'm showing you that our own people created spirituality for the whole world. That we created the world's most astounding civilization, the most enduring civilization based on spiritual principles. But yet, I hear people say, well, Black people act like if, you know, we so holy and mighty, if we were in power, we do the same things that white people do. Who, who, wh why, how? Show me one example of that. Show me an example of that. This is not who we are. We've never been evil people. We've always had a positive, healthy relationship with each other. African men respected African women as equals and as complementary. What if this is what you were taught growing up? What if every day you were saying the 42 laws of my eye? <clears throat> this is a pantheon of ancient Egyptian goddesses and then of gods. Look how many goddesses they were. Newt was the personification of the sky and the heavens. She was the daughter of Shu and Tefnut and the granddaughter of the creator god Atum or Ra. Her husband slash brother was Jeb, the earth god. However, she could also be said to be the mother of Ra. The coffin text referred to Newt as she of the braided hair who, who bore the gods. In one myth, Newt gives birth to the sun god daily and he passes over her body during the day before being swallowed at night only to be reborn the next morning. According to another myth, Ra used the Atet or Matet 
boat to travel across her body until noon and then use the set tech boat until sunset. When you start reading the origin story of the goddess, gods and goddesses, you can understand how this is just African wisdom correlated into an ideology, a cosmology, but it is based on wisdom that is gleaned from the knowledge that they are creating through observation of the world, through observation of the skies, observation of animals. And this is how ancient comedic spirituality was formed over time, not by a Pharaoh to exploit or control, but by the people as a way of making sense and putting order to earth. Let me ask you this. This is a hypothetical. Could you imagine a white teacher in a school talking about African history, African world history, and saying how brilliant African people were? Can you imagine a white teacher saying that ancient Kemet was an African civilization and that African people pioneered everything? Can you imagine how powerful that would be? Could racism exist? You can still have hatred against another person, but this whole concept of superiority of one group or another, you would have to change that narrative real fast. I asked a white person, could you teach this? How comfortable would you be teaching the dismantling of white supremacy? How confident would you be as you talk about how brilliant African people were and how the whole world is indebted to African knowledge and how did African people be repaid? Everybody who came into Africa came to take something from Africa. They didn't came, come to bring nothing. Nobody came to Africa and brought culture. They came to Africa and got culture. No one came to Africa with spirituality. They came to Africa and found spirituality. Talking about a missionary. Okay, guys, we are at 9.03. That is my lecture for today. I'm gonna to open the floor up for questions from you guys. If there are any questions that were in the chat, well, let's check that. Oh, someone did just mention that the 42 laws were said twice a day, yep, morning and night. And it was, I will not in the evenings and I have not. I mean, it was, I will not. And in the evenings, I have not. Thanks for that, Deidre. Questions, guys. I want to talk about this. I want someone to say something. This is religion. How are we in a place in 2021 where none of us have any reverence for African spirituality, foundational African spirituality. How is it that we don't inculcate 42 laws of my eye into our spiritual life? How is it that we're not able even if we don't let go anything else, 
why would we continue the pattern of hiding this? Why would you hide this? This is empowering for black women, empowering for black men, shows a blueprint of how black men work complementary with black women. It shows respect for the environment, respect for yourself, respect for your human being. So you're talking about repeating this, repeating 84 laws in a day, 84 in one day. This is consciously with you as you move. If you introduce this to a young person, they'd be fascinated. Just starting to learn all of the different goddesses, all of the different gods. That's fascinating. It's about them. This lecture series is not just for you to hear some good stuff about who you are. It is for us to understand that we have a commitment to uphold this history because this is what keeps us whole. This is what prevents us from becoming lost and vanquished people. I talked about the Cherokee Nation, Cherokee uh, Native Americans. White people said, you know what? They kind of like white people in the way we think. We're going to try to not just kill them all and see if we can assimilate them into European culture. They went crazy. They literally went crazy when those people destroyed their gods and their worldview and everything that they thought was sacred and made a mockery of it. It drove them crazy. They became despondent. And then the Europeans said, this was a failure trying to assimilate them. So then what came next? Indian removal. This is how powerful religion and spirituality is to a person. And here we are the recipients of this history, of the originators of spirituality. And we've allowed our conquerors to come and tell us we ain't had no religion, thrust their religion down our throat. And here we are in 2021, embraced in their religion and don't know nothing about our own and won't teach it. Won't ask nobody else to teach it, just stay silent on it. Why? Because we're not ready to confront this truth. We're not ready to say, I've been duped because of our own ego. Your ego won't allow you to have given all your willpower submitted to this religion of these oppressors and now in light of new information, I'm supposed to renounce that and start studying my own people stuff? How absurd is that? Instead of being excited, I can finally throw off the yoke of this and embrace my original people's spirituality. We turn our heads too. We don't share it. And then we don't support those who do embrace it. We don't even give them the space to share it. Oh, here come uh, Raheem with this uh, 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 African religion stuff. That's what we say. We'll demonize our own and uphold our oppressors. Demonize your own, 
Uphold your oppressors. I challenge you. You got different knowledge, you got to do better. That's what they say. You know better, you do better. And I know that it's scary. If I've been going to church for 30 years, every other word out of my mouth is Jesus Christ, Father God, and me telling ain't nobody going to shake my faith in my God. Nobody. This is what we carry on and say, and we are proud of that. But what I'm saying is that in light of new information, in light of new information that should be more empowering, that should help shake the mental chains off of us, our ego in the way. Because white people have demonized African and African people so much that you've embraced it. Why have you embraced it? Because you've embraced it, white people. Since you've embraced white people, you got to make a mockery of that stuff just like white people. They playing psychological games on us that is childish. Our children deserve better. They don't deserve to be pushed into a white world that hates them, that rejects them. They don't deserve to be taught by white people that hate them. They don't deserve to be taught a curriculum that erases them out of it, that shows the white man as being the head of everything important. They don't deserve to see the best and brightest of their people only working for white people at the expense of their own community. We are at a turning point in history. With the Black Achievement Fund, we have a simple way to become economically independent. 10 million Black people, $9 a month, 90 million a month, over a billion dollars a year. We can now pay these scared teachers to teach what they're supposed to be teaching anyway, because they're scared. Anytime you can have in Atlanta dozens of Black teachers that will erase a test score, a standardized test score, and put the correct answer in for fear that they would lose their job, that tells you everything. In 1865, we were free from enslavement physically, but the mental enslavement is still on. Here we're in the information age. 20, 20 something years ago when I was an undergraduate student, we couldn't do this on no computer like this. I couldn't share this with people all across the country instantaneously. The burden of putting this together and being able to present it was so great 25 years ago that it rendered it almost impossible. You had to have DVDs. How much did DVD cost back then? $20. Now I can have one platform and show you a million documentaries all over the world. Our time is now. Our time is now, and it's not just about money. It's not just about no black economics. I don't give two S's about USD. This is our time, but in order for it to work, we have to develop a higher level of consciousness, a higher sense of self, and that comes from studying who we actually are. This work has to live on. And that's why this lecture series is in honor of Dr. John Henry Clark. One person can keep the fire going for thousands of people. Recognize your power as an individual. 
and understand our power as a collective. Many of you came on this. You won't tell your other friends or family to come on this. Why? Because you think you'll be ridiculed. You don't think they will embrace this. We have people give us money, but don't want to tell nobody. And 2021. So I asked us, to what extent are we free? To what extent are we liberated? To what extent are we trying to regain our culture or is the fight over? Have we just accepted that we can't beat them? Have we accepted the propaganda that they're superior to us and that the only thing that we can do is join them? Is that where we at? It shouldn't be. And once again, African people, when we were on top, we ain't colonize nobody. When we were on top for 3,000 years, ancient Kemet existed. They ain't try to hurt nobody. They invaded Nubia after the Nubians worked with the Hyksos to conquer Egypt. They expanded the territory during the New Kingdom into the Levant to provide a greater buffer against those Asiatic people that were constantly trying to invade. But they didn't expand their borders there because they wanted to conquer and control those people. They didn't need anything from over there. They did it as a buffer. So what I'm talking to you about shouldn't be, shouldn't scare you. We ain't never out there trying to go and, and, and colonize nobody. We don't have to. But we have to decide, am I going to stay in the closet with my identity as an African person? Am I going to keep these lessons to myself? Do I have any obligation to the children of our race to show them or teach them something better? And it's all about priorities. I'm a busy person, but I ain't too busy for this. I got a lot of stuff to do, but nothing more important than to help to take the shackles off of our people's minds. Because everything that I got to do, everything that I want to do involves my people. I wanna be around other African people, not honorary Europeans. I wanna be around another person who likes being black. Who knows that being an African is a badge of prestige? We got the richest continent on the face of the planet right now today. And we've let somebody talk us into thinking that Africa ain't nothing but poor and poverty. Oh, man. Any questions? <laughs> Any comments? Mr. Tyrone, you unmuted earlier. Did you have a question? And also, Kevin Brown, you both unmuted for questions. If either one of you have questions, just unmute and ask your questions, please. Yes, I'd like just like to compliment uh, our key. Um, I really enjoyed this. It's the first time I ever heard this. And I consider myself a historian. I've known that uh, uh, what you said earlier, that we haven't been told the whole truth. But what was the, what is the truth yet? And you've uncovered some things that I've never heard before. And but yet I looked at some little things that have been coming out like last year or year before. They found a skeletal bones in the skeletal bone of a woman that they call Annie, I think. Did you hear about that? 
Mm, no, I don't think so. In New York? No, they claim that they found the skeletal bones of the oldest woman, and they believe they are saying that she's the mother of the human race. And they named her Annie. But guess where they found her? Where? In Africa. <laughs> and her name Annie. Yeah. <laughs> they, this was this was uh this was either early early this year or late or middle of last year that this was this made the headlines everywhere. They so now they're 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 talking a lot about it. So if they're just discovering that, just think what else they haven't discovered. Uh, but uh, I am really, and then here's another thing: the, the Holy Bible. Like I'm a Christian, and reading the Bible, and we talk about Jesus Christ. Every picture you see of Jesus Christ is always a blue-eyed, blonde hair, handsome-looking white man. And yet, it, and then I even heard a white preacher one day say that Jesus uh, Christ. What did he say? Well, basically, he was saying that he was a white man. And oh, they said there's nothing. Oh, now here's what it was. He said that uh, there's no there's no scripture, there's nothing in the Bible that describes what Jesus looked like, and that's a bold-faced lie. It's it's right there. It says very clearly that he that he, he had hair like wool, uh, sheep wool. That his hair, uh, his skin was like fire, or his eyes were like fire. And his feet, they described the color of his feet. And this is all brown and red and nappy. And uh, and, and it also said something about, um, oh, it even said that there was no beauty that anyone would, de would, would desire him. That, those are the exact words. There was no beauty in him that anyone would desire him. So that means Jesus was ugly. <laughs> So where did they come with this handsome, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, blue-eyed man on the cross saying they said he was Jesus? Now, we know that's a lie. And you know, it's written right there in the Bible. And yet they even, they even say that it's not in the Bible. And it is right there in the Bible. That's where I got it from. I think it's the book of Acts, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, I could go upstairs and get it, but I have it. I have it. My memory is getting back. I'm, getting I'm familiar with that passage. You familiar with that? You okay? Yeah. Then you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So if they lied about that, then what you're saying is quite reasonably to be true, and just as well be true. Uh, sounds more reasonable. It, and um, I really appreciate this knowledge you shared with us tonight. Really, really, really opened up my eyes. Thank you, thank you for tuning in. And you know, yes. you're never too old to learn something new. And that's right. You're never too old to grow. When you talk well, about I thank you deeply. I thank you, Dave. You have really opened my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. When you talk about Christianity, the dates of Christianity, you're talking about 33 BC, 3330 BC. Those are the estimated dates of Jesus Christ walking on earth, which none of this is confirmed. Um, however, think 33 BC, 30 BC to 4,000 BC, do you see the gap? Yeah. When yeah. you leave all the things that I'm showing you, there is no white scholar of any repute that will refute any of this. They have to acknowledge it. This stuff is written on walls in the pyramid. The 42 laws of my eye are written on the walls of the uh, fifth pharaoh of the old kingdom, Pharaoh Eunice. So the evidence pointing to the dates of this religion, they're there, they're still written on the walls right now. But once again, these are the missing pages of world history. This is what is left out because it exposes the falsehood of white supremacy. Now, I don't know a whole lot about Henry Clark, but is this what he taught also? Or did he yes. have this knowledge? Mm -hmm. That what you told us tonight? In, in spades. <laughs> oh, in wow. spades. In spades. And there are a ton of documentaries on um, YouTube with Dr. John Henry Clark. We have a bunch of uh, his documentaries on the Black Achievement Fund's YouTube page, which we need everyone to join. 
we put these lectures on our YouTube page for you to share with other people um, and for you to access if you need to uh, refer to some of the knowledge that we talked about. But we need you guys to go to our YouTube. We need to grow our YouTube presence so that more and more people have access to this knowledge. So please. Well, I thank, I thank you. I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for joining. Thank you for much. Sure. I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> All right. Any other questions Kevin? or comments? Mr. Brown? Yes, I'm here. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy this, and I think that, you know, one of the things that um, I've experienced in traveling to Africa is that <clears throat> We're the ones here, Black Americans in this country that have to build that bridge to Africa. And when I go there, many of the people there, they ask the question, why? Why don't more Black Americans come here and really see Africa rather than what they get at the media? Because the job of the media is to discount Africa. And believe me, they may discount Africa here, but globally, you find white folks, you find Chinese, you find Indian, all of them are there in Africa. And they're taking full advantage of the natural resources that the continent has. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do we today in 2021, get folks to understand how important it is to build that bridge to the continent? I think that is one of the most important questions of the day. Uh, and the answer is manifold. Um, for one, we have to begin to encourage travel to Africa or here in America. Um, number two, we have to abandon um, a lot of our uh, chauvinism as African-Americans. Uh, when Africans come over here, there are plenty of Africans that are over here right now. If more African Americans had more African friends who were right here, they would be more inclined to visit. A lot of those stereotypes will be broken down. But how often do we get out of our comfort zone? How often do we embrace people coming from the continent here? You know, so that's something that uh, we have to work on. And um, I agree with you that a lot of the onus, you know, not all, but a lot of the onus is on us because we can move much freer than people on the continent. They can't Correct. come here as easy as for us to come there. You know, so you're absolutely right. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing with the Black Achievement Fund is we have an international affairs department and we've allocated capital for the international affairs department. This year, we funded four students to go to Dakar, Senegal with the Tungstall Foundation, which is a black family foundation based out of New York. Um, so we're already um, working towards that goal, but it's gonna take, you know, work. Demystifying all of this propaganda. I agree. Yeah. Thanks for your comment, man, and your question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All who, all who are not members. You're breaking up, uh, Keisha. We can't hardly hear you. Black Achievement Fund. Do remember you join the organization you gave me. Um, I've posted the education in the chat. When you become a BAF member, you have immediate access to this curriculum. You guys heard me? Yes. Um, Keisha was telling you, uh, I'm going to translate for you because you were muffled. Uh, <laughs> education for Life, this lecture series is brought to you by Education for Life Academy, which is my private education company. That's my shameless plug. Uh, and you can go to www dot education for life academy dot com and find the full curriculum uh however as members of the black achievement fund you get the entire curriculum along with these lecture series this lecture series from me twice a year uh completely free all right 
So um, to join the Black Achievement Fund, simply go to www.baf.solutions and hit join. Membership is only $9 a month or three cents a day, like one of our ambassadors like to say. Uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3 corporation. 100% of whatever you contribute is tax deductible. All right, so here is an easy way for us to build not generational wealth, instant wealth, perpetual wealth, and to become economically independent as a race for pennies a day from individuals. So please, if you're watching this, join the Black Achievement Fund. Again, www.baf.solutions. We will be back here again for class, I believe it will be class five of this lecture series. And for those of you who missed the other classes, you can go to our YouTube page, just go to YouTube and put in the Black Achievement Fund and you'll be able to see replays of these videos and please share them with others. Once it's on YouTube, just go hit share with as many people as possible and make sure that you comment in the uh, comment section. All right. We are now a little over 930. Thank you guys for showing up. I enjoyed you and I will see you guys again next week.